Thank you to our tech team and our worship team for doubling their service hours each week with now two services. We have a 9 a.m. and a 10.30, and just logistically, if you're ever not here, you're out of town, and you need to watch online, it's the 10.30 service that you'll be watching. So hello to our 10.30 crowd. If a number of you might be sick or traveling, so we have a 10.30 service online. We're actually going to look at today the first church service ever, ever. And do you know what time it was? It was a 9 a.m. service. It wasn't 10.30. The very first service was 9 a.m., so it was appropriate that we launched a 9 a.m. service on the day that we're going to talk about the first 9 a.m. service in in church history. We're looking at the book of Acts, and we're in chapter 2 today. It's the second week of a series on the church. The birth of the church is today's message, the birth of the church. Last week, it was the movement of the church, and every title of the sermon moving forward will be something of the church, right? The movement of the church, today is the birth of the church. And I don't know how you live your life day to day if you're aware that you are spirit-filled. For those of you who know Jesus, you've given your life to Jesus, you are spirit-filled. And we're going to talk about what that, what does that mean? When I was a child, I often heard the message that I heard when it came to church. And by the way, the church is not a building that we come and sit in, right? It's a movement. We're a part of to help people find and follow Jesus. That's the mission of Boulder Mountain Church, to help people find and follow Jesus. And what came first, the mission or the church? The mission came first. God had a mission first, and he gave the mission a church. Sometimes we think the church came first, and then God gave the church a purpose. No, the mission came first, and then he gave the church to fulfill that mission. The mission was given when Jesus and Matthew, the end of Matthew, before he leaves, he gives the great co-mission, which is our marching orders, and every Bible-believing church, gospel-preaching church in the world has the same mission. Words may be a little different, Right? It's evangelism and discipleship. It's help people find Jesus and then follow Jesus. When I was a child growing up, the message that I heard so often was, the church is God's, what? House. Church is God's house. And when we come into the doors of the church building, you better be on your best behavior. And I wasn't most of the time. And I was told we don't run in the church. We don't wear hats in the church. We don't wear shorts in the church. We wear a bed. We tuck our shirts in. This is the message I heard growing up. And I often would be seated in front of my parents, or I'd be seated in front of my friend's parents so they could put their fingers in my arm, my shoulder blade when I was behaving badly. There were all sorts of tricks to keep me in line. None of them really worked. But the message I heard when I walked in was, this is God's house. And maybe a word that we've used is sanctuary. Has anybody ever heard that word? It's a word sanctuary. But today, in the book of Acts, we're going we're gonna to look at where God's house is. And some of us grew up in that. Maybe you grew up in a church, and that was the message you heard and received and believed. I had a friend recently I was speaking to, actually a member of Boulder Mountain, who said, I was that guy that if I walked into a church building, I really believed God was going to strike me down with lightning. I really believe that. There's something about the building that God's not going to like me walking into that building. And for many of our neighbors who do not attend a church, that's that's the message that they've heard, whether we've communicated that. That's what they've heard in our culture, that a church building is special. There's something special about that, that place. And I would make the argument we need to be wise with our buildings, and be good stewards of our buildings. We just laid some new carpet. Many of you were part of that workday, and you're still recovering from that three months ago. 
thank you for that for your blood, sweat, and tears that are now caked into the, the carpet of this, this building. But with that said, carpet will never be more important than people. Buildings will never come before people. People are God's priority. People are most important. And so if some crumbs get on the carpet, it's okay. Because there's a good chance we're reaching kids like, like me who are not on their best behavior. We're in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2 today, and we're looking at the birth of the church. And a number of you asked for notes in the sermon insert. You have them. You're going to have them moving forward. It helps you follow along great. Mission comes first. God made a church for his mission. It's the first line that I hit. Mission comes first. The mission of Boulder Mountain Church is to help people find and follow Jesus. Can you say that with me? We help people find and follow Jesus. If you're out at bashes down the street, and somebody's like, what's your church about? We're about Jesus. Jesus is a big deal at Boulder Mountain Church, and we're either helping people find him or follow him. If you know Jesus, whether you gave your life to him yesterday or many, many years ago, hopefully you're taking steps following Jesus. You're you're following him. There's movement there. If you don't know Jesus, my prayer for you is that you would find Jesus. I'm so glad that you're here today. Our goal for our community is that they would come to a personal relationship with Jesus. It's, it's the same mission every church in the world has. You might word it differently. That's the mission of Boulder Mountain Church. If you're wondering what are we going to do in the future, we're going to help people meet Jesus and help them take steps following Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, Acts describes the acts or the works of the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, the day, we're about 50 days, about 50 days from the resurrection. Jesus was alive on earth for 40 days. He appeared to many, many people, and Scripture talks about that. But now it's the day of Pentecost. The day, this is 10 days after Jesus is like, peace out. He ascends into heaven. And he gives the disciples, he says to them, wait. Anybody else struggle with waiting? I want to go. Let's, let's get stuff done. But Jesus tells the disciples, wait until the helper comes. I'm going to spend, send you a helper. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He talks about that in John 16, John 17. The helper. When the day of Pentecost arrived, this is about 50 days from the resurrection, 10 days after Jesus leaves. So what have they been doing for 10 days? Praying. Praying. Before a revival, before a great work of God, and this is recorded all throughout history, even the church the Great Awakenings, what took place before revival? People prayed. People were intentional with prayer. Ten days of prayer. So we're about 50 days now. Forty days of Jesus, he leaves. Ten days, the day of Pentecost arrives. It's a holiday in Jerusalem. Jerusalem at that time, Rodney Stark, he's a historian, a Christian historian, author. I trust him on his numbers. He says about twenty to 25,000 people lived in Jerusalem at that time. Twenty to 25,000. When there was a holiday, it more than quadrupled. So you could have upwards of 100,000 people are in Jerusalem at this time from different nations, from di different towns. They spoke different languages, and they're all in Jerusalem at this moment in time. It was important that they waited those 10 days if they got started, that would not have been the case. There are only 20,000 people in town. You tracking? So Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, right? They were all together in one place. If you ever wonder why we all gather together in one place, because that's what the early church did. Oftentimes the first day of the week, we gather together in one place. The place is not important, but we do need a place to gather. So this happens to be the building that we gather in. We gather together in one place. It's important that you gather. It's important that we gather. What do we do when we gather? We look each other in the eyes. We hug each other. We break bread out there together. 
We shake hands together. We ask, how are you doing? Some of us, we can tell how the week's been just by looking at our, our friends. It's important to gather. One thing we learned the last few years, how important it is. Let us not forsake this. Let's not take advantage of this or take this for granted that we gather together. And there may be days you wake up on a Sunday morning and the last thing you want to do is go be around a bunch of people. I'm going to encourage you to ignore that and show up. Because when you leave, you can leave saying, I met with God today. And you were encouraged by the person next to you. There's testimony when we sing together, some of us. I'm sorry if you're sitting next to me when I sing. <laughs> but we are encouraging one another when we sing. There's, there's benefit for us being together. It's really important that we gather together in one place. And suddenly... There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. What does wind do? It's usually carrying something with it. Think of monsoons in Phoenix. It's carrying a whole lot of dust. We all have to get our car washed afterwards. We have to dust the back patio and wipe everything down. Wind is carrying something. What is the wind carrying here? It's really important. To understand what's happening in this moment, will you go with me on a little history journey? Genesis chapter 1. We looked at Genesis a couple months ago. God dwelt with Adam in the garden. He lived with Adam in the cool mornings. They walked together. They talked together. They were it was God's presence there in the garden. And then sin entered the world. And then when Moses, we're jumping ahead, and Moses comes down, he brings the Ten Commandments. There's new instruction given about God's presence. And the instructions were, hey, we're going to go camping. Anybody like to go camping? We're going to build, pitch a tent. And the tent's going to be called a tabernacle. And God's presence is going to dwell in that tent, a tabernacle. It's a mobile Genesis 1. The presence of God is going to go with the nation of Israel as they wander there's going to be times they're going to pitch up the tent, pull up the tent pegs, pitch it up, and they're going to go. And in that tent, there were the outer tent and the inner tent, and it was God's dwelling place. If they wanted to meet with him, they would go into that tent. And there were certain rules and laws and regulations, and you can read about it in Exodus 35, where God tells Moses the instructions for this mobile tent. You tracking? And then they go from the tent to a permanent dwelling, during David's reign, God tells David, hey, you're not, you're not, but your son's going to build a permanent home for God's presence. And it's called the temple. It was built in 945 B.C., almost a thousand years before Jesus comes. They built the temple in the city of Jerusalem. And they built this temple. And there were five altars in this temple. There were the, and the innermost was the Holy of Holies. It was a big deal, a lot of regulations, a lot of laws around the temple. In the early book of 1 Kings, it talks about the temple, the size of the temple and all the measurements of the temple. So God goes from the garden, just for a little quick history lesson, from the garden to a tent to a building, permanent building for a thousand years, the temple. Up till that point, you wanted to meet with God. You had to go to a certain location. You wanted to experience the presence of God. You had to go to a certain location through a process, through different people, through priests. If you wanted to find cleansing, you had to go to the temple. There was a process and a location. And so what's happening when the wind is blowing? Where are we in Acts chapter 2? We're in Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The temple. There's a wind blowing. And the wind is blowing from the temple. And it's blowing into a living room where they're all gathered in one place. It's a living room. It's a family room. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. It went from a building to a body went from a building to a believer. The temple, the Holy Spirit left the temple.
presence of God. And did it dwell in the house? No. The Holy Spirit came upon the believers, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, verse 3. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we have wind and we have fire. It's not a band. This is Acts chapter 2. Thank you, the one person who got it. The wind. The wind's blowing the Holy Spirit. Now what's the fire all about? There are people who failed Spanish 3 in high school who are now able to speak fluent Spanish. There are people in this room who are able to speak a foreign language having never gone to school to study that language. Supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit allowed them to speak a foreign language. Now, why would that happen? Remember I said there were people from many different areas, villages, towns, who spoke different languages in Jerusalem at this point. And they're now communicating in a foreign language. Why? So that people would find and follow Jesus. So that the gospel could be preached. What is happening now with the birth of the church is the gospel is for every person on the planet. The gospel is not contained to a certain group of people. It's not contained to a specific nationality or ethnicity or location. The gospel as it is today is for every person, man, woman, and child on this planet. Every person, every tribe, every language, every village, every nation of the world, the gospel is, is for. God loves people. God loves people. And so why did he allow them to speak in a foreign language? So that those who were there present could hear and understand the gospel in their own language. And then what would they do with it? They'd take it home. And that's how the church spread. At this time... Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitudes came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear in our own native language? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia... Phrygia and Parthelmia, Egypt, and if I go through it fast, you don't know I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians were here them telling their own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. They're saying, hey, they're drunk. And later on, Peter gets up and starts to preach a sermon. He's like, we're not drunk. It's only 9 a.m. in the morning, right? It's the first 9 a.m. church service. They're not drunk. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been in environments where worship is happening, the Spirit is moving, and people are swaying, and they got their hands in the air, and they're crying. If you don't know Jesus, and you're looking at that, you're like, what is going on? These people are crazy. This group of Christians, I don't know what they're, what, what's going on here, but they look like they're drunk. They're Spirit-filled. The Spirit came upon them. It was, t it was as if there were tongues of fire above their heads, and they were able to communicate and speak in their own language. Now, the question you would ask me, are tongues still happening today? Is that a gift given today? I know there are missionaries on the mission field today who are not done with their language school and sometimes have not even started their language. And an opportunity is given to them to present the gospel to a, an individual or a whole town, and they are able to communicate in a foreign language. Yes. There are guidelines and there are rules given when it comes to speaking in tongues. What type of church are we? We're a non-denominational church. And so sometimes I get that question. Well, are, we a, are we a church of the gifts or not? Or what are we? The best way I can describe it is I, I love roller coasters. I love adventure. Put me on a ride. I'll, I'll ride all over. I'll, I'll ride the ride 10 times at an amusement park. Best way I can describe it. But on those rides told to put your seatbelt on, put a harness down, keep your arms and legs in the, in the roller coaster at all times. So we're to be spirit-filled church. I want Boulder Mountain to be a spirit-filled church. At the same time, we need to honor God's regulations when it comes to the gifts of the spirit. God's a God of order, and he's really clear on what those, when the, 
tongues are given. Why, were they, why were, was the gift of tongues given at this moment? So that the gospel would be preached. So that men and women who were present would hear the name of Jesus preached in their language. I remember what, before the year 2000, I was in Bible school. And I remember an individual from Wycliffe coming and talking about their, about their goal was 2025. That seems so far away when I was, when it was 1998. 2025, that seems so far away. And they had a vision, 2025, that they were going to be able to translate the Word of God into every language on the planet by 2025. They're getting close. They're getting close. There are men and women who spend their entire life on the mission field translating, first putting the language in written form, and then translating that written form into God's Word. They give their entire life so that a village could hear the name of Jesus in their own language. Isn't that beautiful? That's why the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues was given here in Acts chapter 2, so that they might hear the name of Jesus preached. Now, most of the people I interact with throughout the week, a large percentage of them, they speak my language. They speak my language. The challenge for me is to speak their language. What's important to my neighbor? What's important to my coworker? What's important to your coworker? What's important to the people who don't know Jesus in your life? Here's my challenge to you. Speak their language. Be kind to them. Build a relationship with them. Love them. Be kind to them. Care for them. Show up when they're in need. Show up when they're hurting. Show up. Speak their language so you can introduce them to the person in the work of Jesus. The gospel is preached here in Acts chapter 2. Peter gets up and he gives a sermon in the remaining part of chapter 2, verse 14. He preaches for about 10 minutes. If we put this text to, to time, he preaches for about 10 minutes. You're like, why can't you do that? They prayed for 10 days. He preached for 10 minutes and 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. 3,000 people. The very first church was a mega church. You're like, I don't like mega churches. Well, the very first church was a mega church. 3,000 people right out of the gate. Now, it's about 3%. If there were 100,000 people, there about 3% of Jerusalem gave their life to Jesus on that day. What would it look like if 3% of Mesa said yes to Jesus? What would that look like? Sometimes I think we get the order mixed up. We don't pray for 10 days. We pray for 10 minutes. We preach for 10 days, and three people come to know Jesus. I confess to you that I have not spent enough time in prayer for our area, for this northeast Mesa corner, for Mesa, for them to come to know Jesus. What would it look like if we were a spirit-filled church and we prayed for people to come to know Jesus? 3,000 people. Oh, God's a God of numbers. You're like, well, we're, I'm, not, I'm not all about these numbers. Well, God is. God's a God of numbers. You look throughout the whole Bible, there's a lot of numbers mentioned. There's actually a whole book of the Bible called Numbers. Numbers are important. 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. Now, it's not about the number 3,000. You know what it is about? It's about every one of those numbers is a name. And God knows those names. We, they're not listed here, but God knows their name. He knows their story. Every one of those people were important to God, and they came to a saving faith, saving relationship with Jesus. Every number represents a name, and every name represents a story. You're one, you're one of them. And you're like, I can't save 3,000 people. I can't save all of Mesa and Phoenix. But you know what you can do? You can do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Could you do for one, for one person? Could you begin to pray for them? Could you invite them so that they might come to know, come to know Jesus? The early church, it was believed less than 1% of the early Roman Empire. At the end of the first century, less than 1% were believers. They faced great persecution. And yet, here we are today. And I talked to some of you, you're like, I'm really worried about the church today. Yeah, there's, there's some things to be concerned about. And there's some things the church can grow in and do better. Absolutely. But the church is the greatest movement in the history of the world, and the church continues to move forward. The church is meeting in every nation of the world today. Some in living rooms, some in family rooms, some in cathedrals, some in buildings, some in basements, some in secret. 
some in the dark at night, everywhere in the world the church is gathering. I'm confident in the church will continue to move forward. You are a part of that. You and I get to be a part of that. Little Boulder Mountain gets to be a part of that as we help people find and follow Jesus. Now, another reason 3,000 is so significant, there's another time 3,000 shows up in Scripture when Moses comes down off the mountain the first time. He made two trips up that mountain. The first time he comes down with the Ten Commandments and he sees and hears laughter and partying and he looks and he sees a golden calf. And while they were waiting for Moses, they built, they melted all the, the gold and they built a golden calf. And Moses comes down in anger. He throws the tablets down and, and he causes them. He, there's fire there as well. They melt the golden calf and they grind it into powder and he makes the people drink it. You're like, that's a, I don't remember that story. It's in the book of Exodus. And they place it on their tongue and they drink it. And 3,000 people die that day. 3,000. The other time, 3,000 is mentioned. What the law was powerless to do, Romans 8 tells us, what the law was powerless to do, the Spirit of God was able to do through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Read Romans 8, the difference between the law. See, it's not about behavior. I was told as a child over and over and over, act better, be better, do good, it never worked. It never I failed every time. What the law was powerless to do, God in his grace and the power that raised Jesus from the dead through the Holy Spirit was able to do. 3,000 people accepted Jesus, gave their life to Jesus. A church doesn't have a mission. Mission has a church. If you're taking notes, when we gather together, I'm, I'm inviting you, I'm asking you, church, to be expectant. When you walk in to gather together, wherever we're located, if this building burns down tomorrow, we'll gather somewhere else. Whenever we gather together, I'm asking you to expect to experience life change. There's never, ever a normal Sunday. You expect that when you meet with God, you leave here different because the Holy Spirit moved. Something's different because you met with God today. To be used by God, if you walk in this place, expect for him to use you in some capacity, to change something in your life, to convict you with something. God's home, this is really important, I want to spend a couple of minutes on this. God's home is, is you. We're told throughout Scripture in Acts 17, 24, Hebrews 3, 6, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, all throughout Scripture, God's home is not a building made with human hands. You know where God's home is? The Holy Spirit left the temple and came to dwell in you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And some of you, you're, you're sitting there and you hear that and you're like, I need to do a flip on my body then. I need to do a house flip. We need to, you need to get your body in order. And it's not so that you look good. Don't take care of your body so you look good. Take care of your body. We're to steward our bodies well. Because do you think God wants you to live longer or shorter when it comes to stewarding your body? Do you think more time on earth is a better thing for your neighbors who don't know Jesus or, or a worse thing? Take advantage of the body God's given you. Take care of it. Steward it well so you can be at your absolute best to help other people find and follow Jesus. Your body, listen to this, the creator of the heaven and the earth came and is no longer dwells in a garden, no longer dwells in a tent, no longer dwells in a temple, dwells inside of you. I didn't decide that. I'm just communicating that. I'm sharing that message. That's not what I would have chosen, but God lives inside of you. Everywhere you go, you are never alone. God is with you everywhere you go, every office meeting you walk into. Every time you get in your car, you have a co-pilot. You don't need a bumper sticker. God's with you. In fact, switch seats. Let him drive. And a number of you are like, I'm placed in positions and conversations. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. Listen, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. If you are faithful, you agree, you are obedient to what the Spirit says. He will give you what you need. The power of God lives inside of you. You 
are the home of God. He has chosen to live inside of you. You're a walking testimony all throughout the week. My wife and I had an opportunity to go up to Pine last weekend for a couple days. We were up there. It's a town of 1,000 people. We left the suburbs of Phoenix. Metro Phoenix is 5 million people. We go to Little Pine. We're sitting at a restaurant. There's like three restaurants in Pine. We're at one of them. We're having a burger. And as I come in, I recognize a couple people. There are two families over at another table. I say hi to them. We go and we have, we have our meal. And I'm feeling led by the Spirit to help cover their tab. Led by the Spirit to help cover their tab. I don't know what's going on in their life. I hadn't seen them in six months. I don't know what's going on. But the Spirit nudges me. Now I have to confess I don't always obey the Spirit. I wish I could say every time I'm, I'm obedient to the Holy Spirit's movement in my life. I can't tell you that. But in that particular moment, by God's grace, I responded, and my wife and I covered, covered their tab, picked that up. A couple days later, I get an email. It was actually a text from a couple. I had no idea what was happening in their life and how encouraging that was. I had no idea about that. But God knew. God knew. He's like, oh, I'm going to cover this. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to do something. Are you spirit-led? Are you responding to the Holy Spirit at work in your life? What does that look like as you go throughout your day to hear the nudge of the Holy Spirit? Listen, the implications of this, profound. Number one, you don't have to go to a location to meet with God. You can meet with God anywhere you are, you can meet with God. God is present with you anywhere, anytime. You don't have to, have to wait for a specific time. You don't have to wait for 9 or 10.30 a.m. on a Sunday to meet with God. Where you are, you meet with God because God is living inside of you. The power of God has come over you. What would it look like for us to be a spirit-filled church? It means we take some risks. We do some things we've never done before, and I'm asking you to do some things you've never done before. You're like, I've never led somebody to Jesus. Maybe I'm going to challenge you to do something you've never done before. We're going to have another baptism in October. What would it look like if you were up on the stage baptizing a friend or family member? Now, the good news is it's not a pressure on you. We're faithful to what the Holy Spirit leads. We'd let him do the saving. But let's be obedient to what the Holy Spirit's asking us to do. What does it mean to be Holy Spirit-filled in your life? Are you open to his moving in your life? Are you taking care of your temple? Your body is a temple. For some of us, an action item today might just say, I need to do a better job taking care of my body. Why? Because it's God's house. It's no longer a sanctuary. It's no longer a building. It's you. God chose to, I mean, if I'm God, I'm not, thank goodness. But there's some beautiful parts of the world I would love to go dwell in. But he chooses you and me to live in. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful that you chose to place your Holy Spirit in us. That's humbling it's overwhelming to think of. Uh, forgive me the many times I have not responded in obedience to the spirits moving in my life. I want to be more sensitive. Father, I pray that for our church that we'd be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit moving and working and leading and speaking personally, but also as a church. I pray for the Whatever you're asking us to do, each person in this room, whatever you're asking us to do, and those watching online, whatever it is you're asking us to do, that we would have the courage to do it. We wouldn't just turn off the computer or walk out of this room and say, oh, that was good. That we would say, oh, it was good we met with God today. My life is forever changed because we met with God today. May we listen and hear the prompts of the Holy Spirit as we go throughout our week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.